I was too busy counting people, but yep, we're, we're on now. All right. Today is Wednesday, April 22nd, 2021, 6 p.m. This is the Wanaki Community School District Board of Education, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Ad Hoc Committee. I'm going to go over the agenda. I'm going to uh, do the roll call. Uh, when you hear your name, um, please say uh, present. I hear. Uh, Michelle Berg. I'm here. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, Mike Brandt. Oh, I think he's going to be late. Um, Audrey. Deppin? Here. Katie Grundle? Here. Melissa Hernandez? Okay. Uh, Brian Hafer? Sam Kaufman? Joel Lewis, I'm here. Emily Meyer? Is it Meyer or Mir? I'm sorry. Oh, not here. Uh, Melanie Meister. Monique Mobley. Here. Isabel Moore. Laura Ostrander. Regina Pagel. Here. Let, yep. yep. Uh, Leslie Petty. Here. Mike Pisani. Here. Pamela Potter. Here. Bethany Pottinger. Here. Tim Shell. Here. Stephanie Shefnick. Is did I mess the last name up? Jeff Jack. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Christina Shepelman. Present. Diana, is it Trice Rusk? Very good, thank you, here. Okay, awesome. Um, Nia Vang, is she not here? Nope. Allison Voller? Here. And Paul Whitley. Okay, if I didn't call your name, please just let me know. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do approval of the minutes. Um, the last agenda, um, if everyone had an uh, opportunity to look at that, I just need a motion to approve it. So moved. This is Gina. Okay, Gina. I need a second. Second. This is Diane. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Okay, um, so we, I'm going to uh, approve the agenda for today. Um, I need a, a motion. I'll I move. Okay. It was that Bethany? Who was that? I couldn't tell Pamela. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll second. Okay, <laughs> so Bethany second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, Aye. All, all opposed? Okay, is there any uh, public comments? I have received no public comments. Okay. All right, so the first thing on our agenda is the equity audit discussion. Uh, do you guys want to take that? Who wants to take the lead on that, Tim or Gina? Gina, why don't you launch it and then I will drive the slide deck and comment on it. All right, great. So thank you to those of you who were able to participate in our pre-vote um, opportunity for criteria four uh, with last meeting's kind of loss of quorum at the end of the meeting, we were unable to finish up that task, plus we ran out of time. So we're going to be working to be more mindful about having materials out in advance to have this option to pre-vote so that we can save time and make the most of the time for discussion during um, our time today and moving forward. Um, but in recognition of how long it does take, we are going to, again, introduce 
um, criteria five and we'll, it'll be unlikely that we'll have a chance to wrap that one up today, but we'll just get as far as we can. So um, the materials for criteria four were shared as were um, the, the voting form. So I think we'll just start with discussion of the results of that form. So Tim, if you could share the results screen for criteria four. I will. Okay. Can everybody see the responses, the, the pie charts? Yep. Yes. Okay. Looks good. Okay, so I'm gonna see if I can. Perfect. There we go, improve that a little bit. So um, the first one, our school hires educators who complete an accredited state mandatory residency program prior to obtaining initial licensure or have access to complete an equivalent alternative. Uh, we had 75% of respondents in the improving zone and 25% of respondents in the flourishing zone. Okay, so does anyone want to speak from the 25% about their opinion about flourishing? So again, flourishing is when we're doing more than um, what's expected. Would anyone like to speak to that? Okay, so then the clear majority voted for improving. Is there any discussion on that? Otherwise with a clear majority, we could go ahead and um, just check in to see if this is where we want to place this one. Any discussion about improving? Okay, see how quickly we're moving guys? <laughs> All right. So, um, Katie, are you able to see everyone on your screen? Could you be our stand-in for Mel in her absence of our fist to five? Yes. Okay. Actually, I'm also not sharing my screen, so I could do it as well. Um, all right. So fist to five, five being I'm totally comfortable um, placing this at the level of improving. They are all fives. All right, excellent. So we will go ahead and note that that's where we'll place um, element A. Tim, if you could scroll down to B. Element B, our school offers opportunities to grow educational leaders through formal and informal pathways such as mentoring, state and national endorsements or other methods. And here we had more spread. Okay, so... Um... I'm looking at our lowest ranking, which is not apparent. We had 8.3% say that that was where they were placing it. Would anyone like to speak to that? Okay. Um, next we have emerging. This is where it, the element exists, um, but we definitely have it as a growth area. Would anyone like to speak to that? We had a quarter yeah. of the voters there. Go ahead. Yeah, this is Joel. So um, I would say that just because I don't know where to, to see that, you know, obviously, you know, I hear people talk about it, but I am not 100% sure that this happens. Um, it probably is happening, but I just don't know. So that's why I just put emerging. Um, if I if I knew where to identify that or knew to say yes, this is how I see that, then definitely I would have been higher up on the graph on the uh, choices. Anyone else? So, um, Gina, I do have my hand up. It's probably hard oh, yes. to see. Yeah. Thanks. Maybe I will switch see. my screen to see that. No, no worries. So, when, so I'll, for full disclosure, I did not take this, but I, I do want to ask a question regarding this. 
how do they define educational leaders? Are they the administrators within the school? Because I see in C, CI, effective educators and school leaders. So they're using different language there. So how, so what do we, how do they define educational leaders? Um, in the audit itself, there was no definition of that. Um, but I would say that in the context of our district, we do talk about teachers sometimes being, a, a, you know, educational leaders as well. So if you um, serve on committees, if you participate in building coordinator roles for certain content areas, um, or you're just someone who's involved, uh, I would consider that being an educational leader. Okay. Would okay. anyone have a different perspective on that? So not a, not a different perspective, Gina, but just uh, some additional context. Sure. So we annually submit um, data through a survey as part of the program evaluation for our mentoring program in the district, which is part of a national model. And we do have um, a question that gets to this where we have to report um, what percentage of our teachers in an annual intake cohort that were new to the profession are still with us after five years, and also how many of them have moved into leadership positions, which can include uh, exactly as Gina said, department chairs, department coordinators, administration. So at least in that venue, it encompasses both administrative leadership and teacher leadership. So that so that good that is really good to know because you know that gives you a better understanding on how this this question can be answered. Yep. And I would just quickly add that our discussion last time did include the fact that um, we could be doing more to encourage and mentor um, people that are newer to the profession in preparing them to serve in those leadership roles. Um, so that did come up, and I remember Christy had mentioned as well that there's mentorship for some job categories, but not for all. So we do, we did share in the discussion last time that there is um, some room for growth. So I would say that I um, did not choose emerging, but I chose improving because of that. Diane has her hand up. Thank you. Yeah, so um, I was trying to um, sort of remember all of the different pieces of information that we looked at last time too and, and align it. And, and I did, I felt like I felt like we talked, uh, there, I remember distinctly a lot about some of the teaching assessment sort of pieces that we talked about, but I just felt like I didn't remember if I had all of the information I needed on this particular one. And that was the only reason why I put emerging just because I was not quite sure of what the missing data were. And, 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 and so I might be easily swayed toward improving if somebody could just, you know, sort of remind me, um, you know, just in terms of equity of leadership opportunities and, and, um, and whatnot that would be maybe helpful. Okay. Does anyone have any information on that to share with Diane or perspective? Or she talked about swaying her towards improving. Would anyone from improving like to speak to why they placed it there? I think Monique and Bethany have their hands okay. up. Goodness, thank you. Monique, go ahead and then Bethany. Oh, thank you, Gina. I think um, first from my perspective as a paraeducator, I, I get to see a lot of good educational leaders within our building and work with them. I do hear often, you know, time and compensation for what they need to do is often just lagging behind. They're, they're motivated to want to do it, 
um, uh, even club advisors. I mean, it's a lot of work, even as something as being a club advisor and, and having the time carved out for those things is just not part of the day for people. And um, especially, you know, teachers with young families and many of them are also trying to continue with their accreditations or different programs that they're doing. I, I think that there offers lots of opportunities, absolutely but sometimes there's not the extra support or if you have to miss class, let's say you're going somewhere and you're gonna be gone for the day for a training, not only do you have to, you have to leave a lesson plan behind for everything that your students are gonna, you know, need to be doing. And those lessons plans are a lot of work. So yes, they want to do this, but there's not often always just like that behind the scenes support to say, just go, everything's gonna be okay. It's like, yes, go, but you know, please do these 15 things before you don't show up for work for one day. So I, I think it's really, it's hard for teachers, especially newer teachers who are juggling so many things, you know, within your first five years to be thinking about what to do next because you're just trying to survive sometimes with, with, with what's going on, on your, with your daily work and your daily responsibilities. So I'm here. So I, I had it idea. improving. I, I, I said I had put, um, I'm in the 50%. I said, it's definitely there. And even I, as a paraeducator, I have never been told no, that I can't go do some continuing education through um, WIDA, which is our professional organization, or CISA, which is our, you know, district support. I've always been allowed to do that. So the opportunities are there. But it does take a commitment from the person who's doing it to balance out the other responsibilities. So taking that opportunity to the next level of really supporting um, the people who are taking that on. Okay, Bethany. Um, Monique, that's a, a lot of exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> um, I feel like uh, in comparison to previous school district I was in, I um, really appreciate the opportunity to be in um, departments and be able to be a um, building coordinator for um, uh, different areas of the uh, academics. That's something I don't think all school districts do. And so I think that's um, really great that we do do that. However, I feel like we do lots of professional development in house, but there's not necessarily always opportunities to go further afield, like go to conferences or things like that. Um, and uh, um, I would agree with Monique about the amount of time that it takes to um, to write sub plans or like when things are scheduled, like right now on our Wednesdays, um, it's great to have those Wednesdays to be able to be on committees and things, but then that cuts into our other meeting time or planning time. Um, and so sometimes that can be a little bit diff difficult to, um, to be a leader. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed is that a lot of times there are people like myself who um, are a little more assertive and might be willing to be a leader in lots of different areas, but I'm not sure if we could do more to encourage other people who haven't been in leadership roles as much to, um, uh, you know, to take a turn or have their voice heard as much. So that's why I um, thought we were improving, but not quite flourishing yet. Any last thoughts for improving? We do have quite a majority of improving over flourishing, but if there are any folks who thought we were flourishing who'd like to speak to that, you can do that now. Okay. So again, not everyone had the chance to participate in the pre-vote, so I'm hearing more in the improving area than anything else. Can we do a check-in on fist to five and see if that's where we're landing? So five again is I'm comfortable with improving. One is I'm totally uncomfortable. I see all fives. And a four. Okay, so nearly all fives. Sorry, I missed the four. It was tricky to. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. C1, so effective educators and school leaders are equitably distributed, distributed throughout the district. And there's a suggestion, look at um, your district's demographic information. And uh, because of federal requirements, uh, Wisconsin DPI provides us with a report that shows this, which is what we talked through last time. Yep, so Tim did share last time that, um, I believe this is the one that we would consider um, if there were schools who were low performing, if what their teacher makeup was, and we do not have any schools who are doing that. So, um, all right, would anyone from either not a parent or, um, what is that? I guess just not a parent like to speak to their vote or have a question that we could clarify. This is Joel. Um, I guess my question is, and maybe you did with the language, effective educators and school leaders. Um, so again, for me as a school leader, like administration um, or, and then what's an effective educator? Is that based on teacher performance? Like, so I guess more explanation of that would be helpful. So, um, you know, school leaders would mean uh, our principals and associate principals. Um, effective educators uh, in, in the context, you know, of this instrument um, would mean um, uh, educators who were properly licensed and uh, did, that there is a place on state ed effectiveness systems to uh, mark an educator as ineffective and that that does get reported up. That is a very uh, rarely issued uh, indicator though. So, um, you know, that report that we looked at uh, for uh, a suburban district like Wanakee is really going to elevate um, lack of experience in the report uh, or inexperienced teachers being distributed differently across the schools and it will also highlight those few cases in which we have somebody teaching who is under um, one of the provisional permits, meaning they're not fully licensed, but working towards being fully licensed. And then in terms of administration, um, it says equitable. So like, how do you do that equitably? Like, so what would that look like? So that's, that's a little bit more of a a complicated piece, and again, again, in in a in in the type of this. So this is coming from a national document, and you can go to, um, in particular, large urban districts, where you will have, depending on the urban district, you will have schools that will turn over one third to one half of their teaching staff annually, sometimes within the year. Uh, they might also cycle through principals on an annual basis. Sometimes a, an urban school, uh, and this is not all urban schools, many urban schools have stable teacher forces and stable leadership, and they tend to be the urban schools with um, more conducive learning environments, there are urban schools that'll go through three principals in a year. So in, again, when you look at the national landscape, if you were to apply this nationally, you would see districts where we have a handful just because of the, there's always gonna be people new to the profession, but you can go to some districts in this country where you will see schools where uh, not only do they have high teacher turnover, they might not have anybody with more than five years of experience in the profession. Uh, and they might not have a, a principal that is experienced or maybe even fully licensed due to the turnover. So again, you know, for us, what we would want to look at is uh, the things that this report would flag, those conditions really don't exist to that level in, in a suburban district like Wanakee. But using these reports in Wanakee, 
what you would want to look at is over time, is there one school that always seems to have more new to the profession teachers than another? Uh, now, maybe that's because the school is growing, but maybe it's because that school is not retaining and continually needs to hire new people. And that means your, your new to the profession people never graduate out of that category with experience in the system. But again, so, the report we had, we didn't really demonstrate any of that. So for me, um, I did put um, emerging, but because of that definition that you explained it, I would definitely change my uh, vote to improving. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Others who would like to speak to not a parent or it sounds like we've moved into emerging. I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so would anyone like to speak to improving or flourishing? It does seem that we have a pretty, well, according to this, a pretty clear improving uh, majority. Mike, is that a hand or were you a physical hand or were you adjusting your, <laughs> okay, <laughs> no worries. Sorry, adjustment. I'll try, okay. I'll try not to do that anymore. No, no, just trying to finally pay attention. Okay, I, Diane, Diane, I can see your hand. Sure. So one thing I looked at on the reports, because it was broken down, um, starting with school year 2015-16 to 1920. And I guess I looked like by school to see if there were any trends where um, the experienced, uh, inexperienced teachers or out of field were, were going up. And I feel like I really, the only school I saw upward trend was the middle school. Um, although the, there's a lot of growth in the middle school too. So I thought, you know, maybe that is to what Tim said, where you might see that where there's growth happening and, and one has to, to fill in some teachers. But otherwise, I think that's what I was kind of looking for to, as an indicator, okay, have things you know continued to improve or have things declined a little bit? So I think that's why um, you know I think improving is appropriate because it seems like for the most part, and maybe you know Tim, there's something about it wasn't very high, but maybe there's something about the middle school that might make those numbers look like different than some of the others. But I, I feel like improving was a good category to pick. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts about improving or flourishing? Okay, let's go ahead and check in with the fist to five about improving, which we're not gonna have much stick out here if we say everything is improving, but we'll have a starting place because we've got good notes about all the discussion as well. Okay, I'm seeing all fives, um, except for the cameras off. So I think we can mark that as improving, please, Allison. Thank you, Tim. C2, educator evaluations are based on multiple measures to demonstrate effectiveness. Where to find, consider your district educator evaluation and professional growth systems. And we had pretty much an even split here between emerging and improving with um, one each sitting in the not apparent and the flourishing zone. Okay. So any questions or clarifications we can make for um, anyone who marked not apparent? So that's, this is Joel. Um, I put not apparent because I just don't know. Um, I don't know where to get that information. So I guess if I knew uh, where that information existed, um, obviously I wouldn't. So I just put it in the middle because I wasn't because I wasn't sure. Okay. Any specific questions you have that we can clarify or? No, it's straightforward. I just didn't okay. know. You okay. know. I just wasn't able to answer it. Got it. Okay. Would anyone like to speak for? emerging. Okay. 
Okay. Would anyone like to speak? Oh, I missed a hand. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, all I wanted to say is the reason why I put it in emerging is um, I was looking, I feel like all the processes are really well in place and there's a, the framework seems to make sense. The only thing I missed was I felt like the framework, I was trying to find something within it regarding equity. And I mean, maybe that kind of went with culture of learning, the classroom environment that, that might have fit into there. But I just wasn't quite sure, you know, since we're a diversity inclusion, you know, equity committee, I thought, well, how, how does that element get evaluated? That was the only place that I just wasn't feeling like I was finding the information. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, we did in our discussion last time talk a little bit about how the Danielson model that we do use does not specifically address that. Um, and it frankly wasn't even intended to be an evaluative um, framework. Um, but Tim also shared that that new teacher project um, model has some great equity language in it. Um, so I believe we had in the notes something about kind of just considering as a district how we might um, kind of format discussions that administrators who are doing evaluations might have with um, their educators about equity using some of that good language from the new teacher project. So that is something that we could consider to address that, Diane. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands for um, emerging. Would anyone like to speak to improving? We're gonna have a tie to break, so. Tim. Yeah, I, I just like to, because uh, I think I'm a host or a co-host, I don't think I can put my yes, you're right. digital hand up. Um, you know, I would just, you know, as someone who works a lot with the EE system, uh, in the district, by by design, the state model is intended to uh, meet this very definition and to have multiple measures. Now, I think, you know, Diane uh, made what is a very fair critique of the Danielson uh, practice rubric, which is it doesn't focus on equity and inclusion the way more contemporary rubrics might, but it is the rubric that the state has adopted. Um, so, you know, we, we use the base state model. We haven't uh, applied for an alternative model and the state intends for this model to be a multiple measures model. So that's why I've put it as improving. So do you mean that we could put something with the Danielson framework in the evaluation process or can you speak more to the mul multiple measures? So, um, you know, a multiple measure at effectiveness system is comprised of both a practice framework, which in our case is the Danielson framework for teaching, and then measures of uh, other measures of professional growth and student growth. So that's where, um, and I'm going to try to not get too jargony here, uh, but Gina and the other educators on here, uh, in addition to being uh, receiving feedback from their evaluators on the Danielson framework, uh, they annually complete two documents. One is a professional practice goal, where they basically set a professional growth goal for themselves, state a, a reason for it based on their self-assessment of themselves, based on the Danielson framework, and then what steps they're going to take over the year to meet that professional growth. Um, teachers also complete something called a student learning objective where they set a goal uh, for some kind of assessment measure uh, for where they want their students to be at the end of the year or the end of kind of the data period. And again, they have to ground their goal with a rationale and they talk about their action steps. It's not only intended to be about meeting the goal, it's also about the learning along the way of meeting the goal. Um, 
you know, not in this district, but this really applies statewide, you know, a principal like Mike, um, you know, he has to uh, do a similar thing, only instead of a student learning goal, he gets um, a school learning goal that, that he has to set and, and talk with his supervisor about. Um, and if you are in our district, at least, this is not the case in all districts, but in Wanakee, we also ask our licensed staff who are not principals and not teachers, uh, school counselors, um, speech and language pathology, we ask them to set kind of a program goal and we measure uh, their growth that way. So that's supposed to be the multiple measures. And I'm going on way too long for answering the question. So I am going to just zip it. I would say though, that those goals are all um, educator directed. So if someone does not have a natural equity lens that they that this is an area that they want to focus on, the system does not require that we do that. So if the this, district this is, so I, I am going to unzip here for a moment. I will say that in the original design of the system, there was a strong desire uh, to have part of the teachers evaluations coming from school-wide learning scores in reading, and also um, a teacher value added score based on standardized tests. And in our state oversight committees, um, we had, and that was partly due to federal mandates. And in our state advisory committees, we basically made the recommendation to DPI to go into um, a Rolly Massimino four corners stall on those parts of the, the plan until there was some turnover in Washington and those requirements were no longer in place because we felt that the value added assessment at the teacher level was a very imperfect uh, and even maybe beyond imperfect measure. There is a mul it would play a multiple measure, it just would be a bad multiple measure. And we felt like school-wide reading, while reading is the most important thing that we do, it was really hard to show where every teacher in the school had agency. And in fact, you had situations in states that did this, where I could be hired new to a school this year, and my rating would be based in part on how the kids last year did on their reading test, which I had nothing to do with. So, you know, there were ideas about how to broaden it beyond the SLO, but in Wisconsin, ultimately, we did not go down that path because we felt they were lousy approaches. Okay, so I, I would definitely second that. I don't think that would be equitable in a nationwide picture in any way. But if the district wanted to prioritize pushing all their staff forward in terms of equity, we could embed in the process conversations yes. with administrators and educators about our district goals around equity. Mm -hmm. so. We could. Katie has her hand up. Go ahead, Katie. Uh, one thing I want to add is um, through our new teacher uh, project, there's something called the Optimal Learning Environment, which has um, equity at the foundation. All our new teachers that are going through that uh, work within their coaching model are using that framework um, as their foundation for their uh, discussions around improvement um, and setting goals with their mentors. Uh, as administrators, we've been had discussions around this framework in order to in how we can um, bring that into discussions. Uh, last year when we were doing uh, focused uh, evaluations based on identified goals, um, some administrators, I don't know, I can speak more for the K-4 level, we're bringing that optimal learning environment. Um, uh, it's not really a rubric, but kind of like a rubric into those discussions and infusing it with conversations with Danielson um, and the alignment of the standards there. So I think that there is work and opportunity to bring uh, the equity and other measures and rubrics into discussions around educator effectiveness and infuse it within um, the components of Dan Wilson. Great. This is uh, Joel. Uh, I just have a just kind of quick update. So um, just so we can stay on time, 
Um, what I was planning, I'm just, uh, and if everyone's okay, um, maybe we can push um, agenda items seven and eight for uh, next meeting. So this way we can complete this criteria four and five. If everybody is okay with that, we can do so. If, if somebody has an issue with that, um, you want to just speak up and we can try to figure it out. So does everybody agree with uh, pushing seven and eight? Uh, just rate, put your thumb up. I can't see everyone's thumb, but <laughs> is everybody in agreement? Okay. So looks okay. Uh, Not everybody everybody has a yes, no. Okay. Got it. Okay. So everybody's in agreement. Okay. So what we'll do. Sorry, we'll I had to go look at the agenda items. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so seven and eight, we'll push that for um, next agenda. So this way we can finish uh, the equity items. So oh, is it my understanding that we'll, we'll begin that discussion at the next meeting and not do equity? Yes, you're right. Um, so the, the first clear. thing, yes, yes, that's what will happen. So that'll be up at the top next time. Okay. I'm going to bust in. Um, I, well, I guess we can, I'm just trying to decide. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the agenda. I have something, but I think maybe it can wait till the next meeting. So um, I, I, you know, I don't want to stifle anybody. So I, I'm just making a suggestion. We don't have to go with that. But what I'm saying is, is that I think it's really important, especially for the equity audit that we get this done or what we could do. I'm looking at the time and it's 644. I want to be done at 730. So, I mean, if, if we just kind of go at it, we can maybe be done by 715. Does that sound good, Tim and Gina or? We can see how far we can get, definitely. There were a couple of hands, and Leslie, you have your hand up. I do. Um, so, you know, I'll be up front. It is a little disappointment that we're not going to go through everything that we plan on at, for today's meeting and spend, um, if you will, the lion's share of the meeting on the equity audit. I, I, I got to be honest with you. I think that the equity audit is certainly um, essential and important, but I also think um, that there are other critical matters that I think we need to address, Joel. Uh, okay. I think, you know, one thing I will say, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we were getting these emails with feedback from individuals um, that would, you know, they were coming from Rebecca and just to get a better understanding of what the context of these emails and what that, what that all means. So it, it just, I think that there are some matters that are worth giving some attention and not having to wait another couple of weeks or so for us to discuss. Okay, so Leslie, let me explain that too. So I also don't wanna rush it as well. Um, meaning I don't wanna get into this discussion because there is a lot of stuff, like you said, there's a lot of stuff and that's what I wanna talk about. But the thing is, is just, I feel like, uh, especially me, I feel like, you know, I want to be able to give Gina and the team the time that they need to be able to do this because they have been doing that. And unfortunately, you know, including myself, people have left early. They haven't been able to do that stuff. So I want to give them the space to be able to do that. And then, like I said, and then hopefully move on. But what we can do to kind of, you know, balance that out is, like I said, it's 646 right now. Um, we're probably not going to be able to touch on everything because of time, because I want to keep everybody, I want to keep the meeting on, on point. Um, so I guess I, I just suggested that, so we're not rushing things, but I do hear you, Leslie, because there is a lot of stuff we do need to talk about. And, and I am not ignoring it, and I think what I can do now that I'm processing it is maybe I can meet up with Rebecca and get that. Well, everybody has that stuff that the emails that were sent out. So ahead of time, I think what we need to do before our conversation for next time is already read that stuff and just come to the table with your questions and discussion. And I would just very quickly add that we recognize how much time this is taking and want to be sure that there's a balance um, before Joel just shared his um, idea for changing the agenda. I just was checking in with him in the chat to say, like, I want to be sure that there's enough time left for the other agenda items. 
Um, and we also are continually open to feedback about how we might um, speed this up or um, do it in a different way. So if folks have feedback, we're also all ears either in the chat or um, out in the space. So, so Joel, this? am I hearing that we'll go ahead um, until 7.15 or? Yeah, let's just do the 7.15. And then, like I said, the next, then we'll we'll talk about what we're going to talk about for 15 minutes. And then we'll push everything else over to the next agenda just because of time. And we could also consider, I mean, this is criteria four. We could put a cap on criteria four. We could preview the information as we did for criteria five to the extent possible. We could work to supplement that if folks notice that they have questions of things we didn't get to preview, and then we can try to do the pre vote for next time on criteria five. So how much is for four? Like how many slides left we have? Do we have, Tim? Uh, let's see. Um, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my, my head, Joel, but I think we've got maybe- th I think two there's just more. two, two elements left. Yeah. Okay, so why don't we just, yeah, let's just press forward, get criteria four done, and then go to five. Okay. All right. Um, can you remind me where we left? We're off? on C2, and I, I think we, we voted on the last part. Except the flourishings. Okay. So is anyone interested in speaking to the flourishing? Okay. So then would someone like to suggest what we'd like to vote on? Are we feeling more improving or more emerging? Because um, the pre-vote doesn't decide that for us. Would anyone like to propose doing a fist to five on one or the other because they've heard more of one or the other? I think I heard someone say before that they would lean towards improving. And if that's the case, then we would have a majority of improving. So let's check in there. I'm not seeing anyone with a different suggestion. So let's just keep it rolling. All right, fist to five on improving for educator evaluations are based on multiple measures to demonstrate effectiveness. <laughs> okay, so I am seeing, can you be sure to leave your hand up? I haven't seen everybody. So we do have some variety, um, but there is a clear majority with five. Allison, if you could note that there are some uh, three and a four, two fours and a three, <laughs> and someone wiggling their thumb in <laughs> indecisiveness. <laughs> okay. All right, so we will place it there. And then just as a reminder, this isn't a be all end all. We've got lots of great notes on things that we can address. So D, our district works with area higher education programs to identify and recruit aspiring educators from underrepresented populations and for critical shortage areas. And um, before I relinquish to, to Gina here, I do want to kind of bring back what I said last time, which is by and large, we do not do this. Uh, the one exception is uh, critical shortage areas, um, some special education, some career and technical uh, licenses. Um, we might reach out to the program. Uh, there are very few programs in the state that actually produce ag teachers or uh, tech ed teachers, for example. But, and, and, but we don't do it for all of our critical shortage areas, and we don't do it at all for underrepresented populations. Okay. Um, would anyone like to speak to does not exist with 41.7% of the votes? Um, I would say that, um, I, this is Joel. Uh, and sorry, I don't have a hand to put because I'm host, uh, co-host. Um, I guess for me, you know, this is just plain and simple. You don't see underrepresented populations. Um, all like you, so I'm assuming, you know, we need to work on this area. And then I guess, you know, Tim, when you said critical shortage areas, um, 
you don't what could you re could you explain that again when you talk about critical shortage areas um does that mean for the district critical shortage areas well so so our critical shortage area where we um it's like hard to fill we have, positions. yes we have a better ability to fill than the average school district does uh so, so there are more areas that are critical shortage than we always encounter, but in a nutshell, uh, the state is desperately short of bilingually licensed teachers, uh, which to operate a bilingual program, you need a bilingual teacher. Uh, and you hit a certain number of students uh, with a different first language than English. And by law, you're supposed to have a bilingual program. Don't have enough of those teachers in the state. Uh, same for uh, certain special education areas, including cross-categorical special education. Uh, same for um, uh, tech ed teachers, family and consumer science teachers, and ag teachers. Those are areas of very short supply. And then you get into like upper math, certain sciences, some world languages. It's not great either. But critical shortage would be the ones I iterated. Just and, then my, I, and then my next question would be, um, how come we're not reaching out to underrepresented popula populations? Is it because uh, there's such a, an abundance of teachers in general, so there's no need to reach out to those areas or? So, you know, historically, where there are licensed people, um, so in non-critical shortage areas, we've always been very satisfied from just looking at the numbers of licensed appropriately licensed individuals in our applicant pools. Uh, applicant pools have grown shallower over time, but you know we still have ap deep applicant pools. What we don't have are diverse applicant pools. Uh, but up through today, uh, we have really not taken any affirmative steps to try to diversify our applicant pools. Yeah. So I would say just in the interest of time, we have clearly identified this as an area of need. And so it will be something that will be near the top of our list of things to work on and to make a strategic plan for. So I think um, while it's important for us to reflect on why aren't we doing this, um, we've just identified that this is an area that we we do need to address. I see so, Leslie's hand up, though she might have something to offer. Thank you. I got to get back to that screen. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Joel and Tim, for your perspective and your questions. I really think that they're they're important. I think also equally important would be um, the leadership in our schools. And not only the educators, but also the leadership um, in administrative roles. Mm -hmm. I think this question does not address it or ask, and perhaps maybe that will be in another section or area, but I do think that we need to be mindful of that. That it, it's not only with our educators, but it's also with our administrators as well. That plays a significant part. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, I don't see any other hand. Oh, Pam, go ahead. Um, yeah, so the question is really about uh, working with area higher education programs. So do we just not have a mechanism for that at this point? So typically, um, because our applicant, except in areas of critical shortage, we really don't reach out uh, to um, pre-service programs to recruit applicants uh, unless we have uh, a critical shortage area. So if we are looking for a tech ed teacher, we will reach out to the one or two pre-service programs in the state that license tech ed teachers, of which the number of tech ed teachers that are licensed in the state annually, you can probably count in, in two hands. Ag teachers, you can count them on one hand. So really, that's the only time we've reached out to programs at all. 
um, you know, for, um, you know, areas where we have greater supply, um, elementary licensed teachers, we would not normally actively reach out to those pre-service programs um, for underrepresented or not underrepresented uh, applicants. But if our goal was to diversify teaching staff, we would. Yes. So, um, not seeing any hands. Anyone who we haven't heard from like to speak to their vote? Okay, so um, with the 50% um, at not apparent, let's check in to see if that's where we'd like to land. So five to five, fist to five, five being I think not apparent is where this should be, which again means element is not demonstrated or evident. Okay. So we do have a two and a three and some fives. So um, without objection, we'll call this not apparent and identify it so far as our least ranked um, number one priority because uh, we're not there yet. All right, Tim, if you would. E, our district offers competitive educator compensation and working conditions incentivizes national board certification, honors representation by unions with collective bargaining rights, and permits educators to bargain teaching and learning conditions. Uh, and we had kind of a critical mass at emerging, and then we had uh, three other categories represented. Okay. Um, so, it's funny how these shift color. Nobody was non-existent or not apparent. Okay, so let's begin then with um, flourishing. We had flourishing and what is this other one? Not applicable. So I, I'm the not applicable. I, I am the not applicable. <laughs> okay. Um, I just felt like even though I think within our county we have competitive compensation, we can always work to improve that. And, and we do incentivize national board certification. The reality is in the state of Wisconsin with the statutory uh, restrictions on collective bargaining, it's, it's very hard for me to rate an item that leans so heavily into collective bargaining at all. So I just went within it. Okay. So we've heard from the NA, would our, um flourishing person like to speak to their thoughts on that? Okay. Um, improving is our next category. Would anyone like to speak to why they leaned improving over emerging? Um, I believe I did that, but I don't recall because it was a long time ago. Um, but I think I landed in improving um, because though the law of Wisconsin does not require um, official collective bargaining, um, my roles within the Wanakee Teachers Association, um, from that perspective, I've seen lots of opportunities for teacher voice. I think we um, have what lots of other school districts don't have in that area um, in terms of both compensation, working conditions, and then um, that teacher voice component that I think is the spirit of the um, collective bargaining section of this element. Um, but I do not think we are flourishing. I think we've got room for improvement. Anyone else want to speak to improving? Okay, then we had a majority with emerging. Would anyone like to speak to that? Yeah. 
Diane has her hand up. Thank you. Um, I picked emerging um, for the same reasons that Tim um, picked not applicable. I just felt like there's a lot of limitations on any sort of collective bargaining. So it was perhaps, perhaps some of the other pieces existed, but because they all can't exist now, that obviously is statutory. Um, nevertheless, it is a little you know, restrictive. So it was hard for me to go above the emerging. Okay. Other perspectives on emerging? Okay. Um, emerging currently has the majority. So let's check in to see if that's where we're going to place it. Fist to five for emerging. And as a reminder, this is our district offers competitive educator compensation and working conditions, incentivizes national board certification, honors representation by unions. Okay. Um, four, 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 four. <laughs> Again, with the, the flapping thumb. All right, I do see a majority with um, emerging. Okay. So and those are all another, of our votes. This will be another category that could be addressed. Okay, so um, looking at the clock, I believe we have time, Tim, to have you quickly walk us through with the goal of in the next 10 minutes, just previewing criteria five, and then we will share with everyone another opportunity to pre-vote on this category for next time. Okay, thank for you. For the next time. Where uh, I see Monique with her, her hand up. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry, but my heart's just kind of pounding a little bit as I think back on um, question D that we were speaking about earlier. Um, <clears throat> I know that we have great teachers at our school. I also know that we have very few teachers of color. And I also know that just a few weeks ago, I was in a club meeting and we had a young student who was having an opportunity to speak with one of our students, our teachers of color came and spoke to our group. And he's a senior now, the student. And he said to this teacher, who's also a coach, mm -hmm. I wish that I had known you before. Mm -hmm because I would have stuck with what I was doing. So I think it's very important that our school continue to hire good teachers and teachers of color because our students want that. So sorry, I a little emotional on that, but I, I really remember that student saying, I could have been a better student if I had had somebody to look up to. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Monique. Um... I wasn't there, but I heard about that second hand. Well, actually, first, the, the, the student told me later on that very same account and how important it was to him that we had hired uh, that teacher at the high school who's new this year. So um, criteria five, our educators are engaged with the district in developing formative and summative assessments that employ multiple measures of growth pursuant to state policies. So um, in, in our district, our professional learning community model, which you've heard about before, uh, really does place with our teachers um, a lot of professional autonomy around the assessments for the courses that they teach when we select district level assessments, um, we will bring together a committee to provide input on an example, the star test. When we switched from MAP to the star, we had a committee uh, with educators on it. They're involved in the selection of that. So um, just real quickly, that's what we do. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to get through all of these criteria, but if any of our 
Um, teachers here want to briefly add additional context. Great, otherwise we'll move to the next criterion. Okay. If I can just add them really quick, sorry, my hand with the split screens isn't working right now. Um, with, I feel like this, with the collaboration, at, especially at the elementary level that's happening across the district, um, with all three schools this year, the common formative assessment, that means like the consistent assessments that are being developed is stronger than ever um, with that collaboration that's able to happen. So I just thought to add that in too. Yeah, and appreciate you sharing that, Allison. And, and to provide context on this criterion, I mean, there are, there are school, there are districts in this country where the district will tell teachers or try to tell teachers down to the day what exactly they should be teaching. And the district will provide with very little teacher input, if at all, what assessments they will use in their own courses uh, to gauge student progress. And that's not our approach here in Wanakee. Uh, 5B, our school ensures all students graduate college and career ready uh, by implementing programs and practices proven to address barriers to advancement, <laughs> such as SAT, ACT preparation, college and career counseling, and complying with state and local policies. Uh, and so um, the district annually adopt, we, we do annually adopt standards. Um, and in normal situations, we adopt the Wisconsin state standards, unless we feel we have some better ideas locally, synthesizing some different standards documents. All of these uh, standards that are adopted are intended to prepare students if they meet the standards to be college and career ready. Uh, our district also, like all districts in the state of Wisconsin should, uh, provide an academic and career planning program uh, for students in grades six through 12. Uh, which means beginning in sixth grade, our students uh, complete a variety of career exploration uh, and self-exploration activities uh, that are documented in a platform called Zello. It used to be called career cruising. Uh, if, you had, if you haven't had school, kids in the schools in a few years, you might recognize career cruising. And uh, we do have our career workshop course in 10th grade. Um, we do um have some computer-based access if students wish to to ACT prep and uh, our instructional coach at the high school Mr. Mike Dreyer does offer uh, a an ACT prep course uh, that's voluntary for kids outside of school hours but we really don't have a test prep as part of our core instructional program that's never been Part of our vision in the district. Uh, 5C, our district receives adequate resources and funding from the district to provide educator training on the use of data to improve instruction and assessment. Um, trying to put my mind in the space of the, the, the folks who developed this criterion, um, there are states that provide uh, designated funding for data coaches and data workshops uh, for educators. Uh, Wisconsin provides some resources we can tap into um, and instructional coaches, you know, like Allison do have some very good expertise in the use of data that they bring to their work with teaching teams. However, Wisconsin doesn't provide targeted funding for data and continuous improvement training. They have some resources, but they don't fund us to train everybody in that. Um, and we do some organic training and continuous improvement uh, processes in our data systems when we do school improvement activities. Each school does an annual institute. Um, schools may have site-based meetings, but again, we don't have a very large dedicate, dedicated professional development track solely on the use of data uh, and school improvement. Uh, so I just editorialize this is probably a growth area for us the way that uh, the authors of this design this criterion. Uh, 5C2, educators have timely access to student data and assessment results. So uh, the first thing I would observe back to uh, criteria 
5A, most of our assessments are teacher generated. So inherently teachers have timely access uh, to the information from the assessments they administer. For student assessment data that is not directly generated by teachers, district-wide testing like the STAR, um, attendance rates, behavior, uh, report card data, um, that's regularly added to a staff resource called EduClimber and uh, staff can look up uh, that data and that makes it into the portal fairly soon after we receive it, sometimes uh, with an auto upload within a day. Um, 5D1, educators are given opportunities to collaborate with the state and district to develop school performance indicators. Uh, and this gets to the ESSA plan. So, um, you know, in our school improvement model, the way Wisconsin gives school districts, as long as they're not identified as being in need of improvement, a lot of local flexibility in their school improvement processes. In Wanakee, we do have a high level strategic planning framework for the district, but the core of our school improvement efforts are uh, vested at the school level. So if you're to look for actual improvement goals, they're vested in schools. Uh, and then also our academic departments also are engaged in goal setting. And as we talked about in the ed effectiveness piece in the last set of criteria, um, we have SLOs, which are um, improvement goals uh, that teachers self-generate. So our school improvement goals are generated the site level through um, school improvement institutes. Uh, and although we invite uh, our educators to be actively involved, SII is not a mandatory activity. And I've seen some flash in the chat and Joel's just telling me to hurry it up. Um, <laughs> 5D2, uh, low performing schools provide additional supports and funding to students such as needs assessments and on site evaluations and um, we do not have low performing schools as understood under federal law and this instrument. So this is uh, 5D really isn't applicable to us. 5D three, our school works closely with students families and support networks to ensure the success of students who are at risk for academic failure. It, at the individual level, families are do receive notification, are engaged in discussions around students who are at risk. And if they're in our RTI or response to intervention program, they receive updates. Um, however, um, our school-wide conversations uh, beyond the individual child are relatively limited. And we have never really interrogated our engagement strategies around RTI or other areas uh, to determine if they are culturally responsive and equally inclusive of families, regardless of background. And that's it. Oh. Tim, that was awesome, right on time. So if you do have <laughs> questions, please put them in the chat before the end of the meeting or feel free to email Tim or myself. I'll put my email in the chat as well. Um, and then we can follow up before pre-voting. Thanks, everybody. So do you want, oh, do you want us to, are we going to do the same thing? You said we're going to pre-vote. You're going to send it out and you do the same thing. That's what I was thinking. Where's everybody at? Does that sound like a good plan? Did this I mean, work that was pretty okay? efficient. That worked out well, I thought. Okay. We will plan for that. Thanks. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, the next agenda item um, is uh, discussion and possible actions on interim recommendations to the Wanaki School Board of Education regarding issues of immediate concerns. Um, so Tim and I, well, Tim and I will be talking about the reporting system. Um, I, Tim and I haven't met since we spoke last time. Um, so I don't really think there's an update unless Tim has an update, um, if you wanna speak, Tim. I think the next time we meet Joel, we'll be able to go over a draft. And I am willing to have that meeting at any time, even if there is no city barbecue present, my friend. It's OK. Well, we can have city barbecue and do that. But yes. And yes, yes but I think if we meet in the next week, we can move this along and 
and yeah, have definitely. something for the next meeting. And I'm open to any time, so yeah. we'll, 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 we'll make that work. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the next agenda item is discussion of Native American imagery and mural within the uh, Wanakee School District buildings. Now, um, obviously, there's a lot to this. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to say much. I'm going to let Leslie just kind of speak on it, and then um, I'll hold my stuff for, for later. Okay, well, um, yeah, I, I think where I, what I like to do is get a better understanding of the protocol, if you will, it's, it's the protocol with the, the, the committees related to the school district, uh, school board, excuse me. I, I think because what has happened is, is that we received these messages and, and there was very little context. So someone who, like me, who is a parent on the outside looking in, I don't think I really was able to get a, a an understanding of why um, the certain committee felt did not felt that it was not their responsibility to to speak on this particular area. So I, I think if there's some some clarity and what this means and how we are to address this. Because what I don't want is to find ourselves with barriers that certain individuals feel that they have, that this particular matter does not apply to their mission or objective or goals within that committee. Um, and if that's not the committee that this runs through, then what committee is it? And how do we address this without having this um, this type of communication? That's pretty unclear. So, this is Joel. So, to add to it, so uh, I, I totally agree with you, Leslie. I think what happened was, um, were you there for the last meeting? I could remember. I was not. No, because I think okay. the last meeting was during Holy Week. Oh, okay. I think, yes. No, no, I think it was yeah. on Holy Thursday. Yeah. No, I actually left early to go to church, but yeah, um, that's, that's, <laughs> I did I say something. That, right. I think yes. it was Holy Thursday. Yeah. Okay. So, bas it. so basically, there was a lot that came up. So, um, so the board um, did have a meeting prior to that. Their and you know their monthly meeting. And there were people, I don't know if you saw that board meeting, I don't know what date that was, that actually came and spoke about having the mural taken down. Um, I didn't know that was even happening. Um, and I, it, it, it kind of was just like, how do, the, how do the people know that the board's having a meeting or voting on that and then they have stuff to say? Um, so I brought that up last time because I was kind of frustrated. Um, and I think the biggest thing for me, the reason why I was frustrated um, is um, because when I received more information about the mural from Tim, uh, not our Tim, uh, what's his last name, D D Dakota? Tim Decora. Yes. Decora. Decora. De Kim, thank you. So when I spoke with Tim, he pretty much enlightened me um, what was um, going on in terms of with the mural. There's a huge history behind it that I didn't know. And I wish I knew that information before I cast in my vote last time. Um, and I think the thing for me is, is that Tim is Ho-Chunk, right? We're talking about, um, uh, an individual um, who has an opinion on this. And, and I think the biggest thing for me was that we need to just slow it down and then have the conversation and then all this other stuff that came into it, all this other information. So Tim's children, um, they also, I think, wrote in um, and I read that, if everyone read that, and then Tim wrote in and Tim spoke. Tim was, he, he spoke last time for, for public comments. So based on all that information, I just felt like we shouldn't rush. But the thing is, is that obviously the board um, 
took our consideration, but then they moved it to uh, Tim. What's the name of the committee that they moved it to to look into this? It, it was routed to the goals committee of the Board of Education. Yeah, so I didn't know much about the goals committee. Um, I just found that out myself. Um, so the thing is, is now this issue is with the goals committee and then a goals committee, and if I'm wrong, correct me, Tim, is not making a decision. They're making a recommendation to the board and the board's going to decide what to do. So but I, I, I can provide some new information to this. Oh, okay. I don't, but I don't want to until you've kind of, you know, shared what you want to share, Joel. Okay, I'm almost done. So, so pretty much because everything was moving so quick, and I feel like a lot of people, uh, certain it, things are happening, which I don't feel good about. Um, I hope we never make decisions that fast on things just because we feel like it's the right thing to do. Of course, there are right things that we need to do, right? If we, if if there's something blatant that is in your face type thing, but this this has been going on for the last twenty plus years, according to Tim. Um, um, and the thing is, is that I feel like we just kind of need to hear um, what uh, what we can do or, or how we can make this situation uh, just maybe look different. So we're not offending people. So we're doing what's culturally relevant so that we're honoring Ho-Chunk. There's a lot of things that we need to look into. So that's where my mindset is with this. And I guess, and next time I'll put it on the agenda, I just was going to make a motion to be able to bring it up so we can have this conversation and then let the board know where we're coming from. You know, if we go, if we go in that direction. So I'm done, Tim. So what I, what I can say is um, just kind of a follow-up. So the, the board sent it to the goals committee um, and the goals committee made a recommendation that the matter uh, be assigned to administration to develop a process to address uh, the future of the mural and the gym and the other aspect of um, the recommendation from this group, which was a land acknowledgement. And so uh, Randy and I have begun that process. We've had a few meetings on the topic. We met with Tim DeCora yesterday uh, to have some discussions about um, what a process might look like. Uh, we're going to bring a recommendation uh, to the Board of Education at the regular May meeting around what that process could look like. And I think, you know, a recognition that, you know, we have is uh, while there is a lot of moral clarity around the image in the gymnasium, there are also some complexities to the issue. Um, so there is the representation, so there is the image there is also the issue of affirmative representation of um, Native American nations within the school district and also around land acknowledgements. Uh, land acknowledgements are often authored uh, without um, any real participation of the indigenous peoples for whom they refer. Uh, and frequently are uh, sometimes viewed as performative actions uh, that then don't really lead to follow through in the work of the organization. And I have to say the village is working with the Nelson Institute and the Ho-Chunk Nation, uh, the school districts involved to a degree. Uh, Diane and I were actually in an update meeting today. And I do think there is going to be um, some synergy around this community-based partnership with the Ho-Chunk Nation and the recommendations of this committee uh, that um, you know, we will have to see how the process unfolds, but it would be our hope that we are able to uh, positively engage with a variety of interested stakeholders, um, if possible, uh, engage with the Ho-Chunk Nation uh, itself and uh, address not only the gymnasium, but also um, address issues of broader representation of uh, 
the Ho-Chunk Nation in the school district. Uh, but again, that's aspirational. We're working on the process, but that's where the actual state of play is right now. And um, I will say this, I don't have a description re uh, indirectly related to this. We are going to be uh, working with uh, the university and the Ho-Chunk Nation to have a uh, workshop specific to cultural responsiveness and issues of Native American culture in the district in June. Uh, it'll be by Zoom. When I have the description and some of the final arrangements, in addition to sharing it out with our staff, I will also share it out with the committee. But uh, to kind of recapsulate, uh, there is a, um, it is, the goals committee sent it to the board, the board charged administration to come up with a process. Um, Randy and I have begun work on that. And uh, Randy with, you know, some additional um, contributors will be sharing uh, that proposed process at the regular meeting of the board in May, which is May 10th. So, um, and we have like two minutes, so I just wanna put that out there. So um, in terms of uh, Tim, does he um, agree with the process that's going on? And does he, what, I guess, what do you know what his, cause you said you spoke with him. What was his um, opinion about what's going on? So it's not my position to speak for Tim, uh, but um, you know, the, the goal that Randy and I have as part of this process is, you know, certainly uh, Tim, uh, is a, uh, a staff member of longstanding. He is a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Uh, and we want him as part of the team. Uh, we anticipate enlarging the team, but Tim would be part of what we hope would be uh, a team to help facilitate the conversation. Um, and, you know, I think we had a good meeting yesterday, but I think we've got to actually get these proposals to paper. We've got to see exactly what some of the points of contact for partnerships are. But, uh, you know, certainly we are uh, working to include Tim and we will be working to include others as well. And the reason why I ask that is because, you know, I don't want to also, you know, miss a lost opportunity. Um, I want to make sure that the people who need to have voice in this situation has voice. Um, so that's why I just asked you that question very specifically, because, you know, obviously, uh, as us being our own entity, um, I want to make sure that we're doing what we need to do um, as well. So, but, but thank you, Tim. Does anybody I, else I have do some hands up? So, okay. Yep. Um, let's go, uh, Pamela. I'm sorry. I, I don't know who put up the hand first, but can we go with Pamela? Uh, yeah, I've, I've um, you're going to get tired of me hearing me say this over and over again, but I think that um, we've done our job. And I think that the fact that we, um, we, we are uh, an advisory committee, the fact that we put our recommendation out there, the fact that it has had results and, and, and there is action being taken on our recommendation, I think we've, we've done what we had to do. I would not go back and say that, oh, we should have given it more time. We should have given it more discussion. I think that we had um, a wide range of information at our disposal. Um, uh, as I think I mentioned before, I was particularly struck by the report that we saw that said that uh, Native American students are very much um, emotionally affected by such imagery. So I think the fact that Tim Decora expressed his viewpoint is great and it got the conversation going and the conversation is, is out there in the community, um, but he doesn't represent the entire uh, Native American population in our community. And if there are people out there who are who do feel uncomfortable with this, uh, but aren't vocal about it, then um, again, I think that we've done our job by getting the getting the conversation going. Okay. Who had their hands up if you just I can't really see. I don't actually see any more hands up. Does anyone else have anything else to say on the on the matter? Now, I guess for Pamela, so you said we had a whole bunch of information, I guess, did, was there other information shared that I missed? Um, 
Because I honestly really thought it was more we were trying to do like low hanging fruit, something we can do right now. Um, and yes, we did speak about it. Um, but I guess I, I wouldn't say, I guess for me, when I saw, and I think this is what bothered me, is when I was, when I saw that at the board meeting that there was all these individuals who were, who came to speak up about it. Um, that kind of bothered me um, because I feel like, you know, if you're in the know about something, then um, stuff like that gets vocalized, that type of thing. And then decisions get made and then it's too late to, to uh, either change your mind, talk about it, that type of thing. Um, and I feel like being um, the committee that we're at, you know, just because we say one thing doesn't necessarily mean we can't step back if we find out that it's causing harm or we're doing something unintentional uh, that we need to make right. So, you know, I just say, you know, we should probably just be aware. That's all. I'm not going on either side, but, you know, I just want to make sure that um, we do what, what is right. So um, if there are no other, I'm looking for hands. Oh, I think there's a hand, Gina. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of, um add to what Pam mentioned because I am um, currently of the same opinion that I think that everybody's individual voice is important and I'm very glad that I had a follow-up conversation with Tim DeCora. Um, I learned a lot about his perspective um, but I have also been a part of a lot of statewide conversations through WEAC. Our state president has Native American heritage and every single statewide meeting starts with a land acknowledgement. Um, the people who sent public comment that first um, day that we discussed this um, are actively involved in sharing data. I mean, so when Pam talks about the data that we had, there were links sent to us prior to that vote of tons of research about how uh, imagery such as what we have impacts Native American students. Um, we also heard um, perspective from uh, parents in the community who are not of Native American heritage who said that they don't want their students to have a characterized, characterized picture of what it means to be a Native American. And so people can have all all kinds of different viewpoints and none of them are, you know, necessarily misinformed or misguided. Um, so I do want to encourage us to be intentional about sharing what we're gonna be talking about in advance and making sure that people know that we're gonna talk about it so that we can hear from all these different perspectives. Um, but I also want us not to take one voice as all of the voices. And so I um, look forward to seeing the information shared in advance of the next board meeting. Um, and I hope people are paying attention so that they can share uh, their perspectives again. Now, I, I keep hearing this theme and Mike said this last time, like, it just seems like, I don't know any background. I didn't even know Tim existed. Um, obviously he was a coach and gym teacher and working there. I, and my kids probably said something, but I didn't pay attention. Um, but what I'm saying is, is that I, I just, and I don't know if this is just me, but I'm getting a sense, like, is, are, is there background history that I'm just not aware of? Because I keep hearing that thing, you know, I keep hearing that same thing, like, you know, he's one voice, you know, um, it's just one opinion. But, you know, it's kind of like if, if there was something that had to do with African-American history and the two African-American people in the room was against something. And you just say, well, you know, I'm glad that you two spoke up, but us non-African-American are going to make the decision. So I guess that, I think that's where I'm at. Like, I just don't understand fully. And we don't need to have this conversation here on this forum right here. I mean, we don't need to talk about that, but I think that's where I'm just kind of shaky. Um, I just, feel like uh, I'm not getting the full information um, or there's things that have happened in the past that we're just not bringing up or talking about. But it is 737. Hold on. I think there's a message. Um, okay. Okay. 
So um, this will, we can discuss this, you know, we'll put this back on the agenda um, so we can have a little bit more time to discuss it because I didn't want to rush it because I knew that was going to happen, but I wanted to uh, just be fair and just bring it up. Um, if no one has any further, uh, oh, actually, if you do have things that you want on the agenda, and I see you, Christy, uh, yep. then please um, reach out to uh, Rebecca um, um, before, and she puts out the email, so, so it gets on the agenda. Go ahead, Christy. Um, I'm, I'm going to be really brief. Um, I went to a fantastic training with a bunch of high school kids, Dane Countywide, and David O'Connor, who is a DPI consultant who is Native American led the training with the students. And we had some Wanakee High School students there participate in the training. And I'm gonna just leave us with a short exercise that y'all could do on your own. But um, it's simple, just Google Native American, Google American Indian, Google African American, and Google Latinx or Hispanic American. Um, and look at the images and you'll notice some trends and some things. And I thought it was a really powerful way of explaining imagery. Um, and you'll notice two things. I'm gonna give you the answers, but basically um, you'll notice that the depictions and the images from Google tend to be of Native American, single Native American and um, older in nature versus the um, other races are, um, tend to be more modern, more groups of people. Um, and he talked a lot about imagery and our high school students were pretty fired up about it. So I think that there's a lot of work to be done um, educating ourselves. And I just kind of want to leave us with that. Um, I still feel like I would love some more high school voices of current students. Um, and, you know, I think that um, our work is really valuable, but I thought that was fascinating and um, really poignant to some of the things that we're all discussing too. So, and that's, that's it. Could you send that um, out to the group? That uh, yeah, because that'd be cool. I would like yeah. to see that. That'd be awesome. And then and I'm going to leave us one Go other ahead. thing, um, and I think this is going to obviously be for next time. And I feel like all of a sudden I'm talking a lot, but um, I'm not. Um, I wish the district had a stronger response, um, district wide to parents in regards to the Chauvin case, and really watching what other districts have done for response and action. Um, and I know that this is not an agenda item for us to talk about now, but I would like to talk about when incidences happen nationwide and our response as a district and maybe looking at the board a bit um, for their support in that. And I'm really sorry to leave that big thing with all of us, but I feel like I have to say it. And, and Christy, I'm glad that you did say it. I'm not going to talk about it because it's not on the agenda, um, but it's going to be on the next agenda um, because it, it obviously a big thing happened and we really didn't even have the conversation. Um, so it'd be interesting how we're gonna proceed forward as a, school, as a community and as a school district. All right, so um, I lied because it's 7.40. We should have been done at 7.30, <laughs> but it's okay. We're talking about some good stuff. So, um, all right, so have a, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second, oh, thanks, Tim. Um, everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. Everyone, everyone opposed? All right. So we'll see everybody next time. Take care.